What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have with Mark today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Mark Doust. He's founder of Quiet Light Brokerage. He founded it back in 2007, and they help entrepreneurs with an online business sell their website for maximum value, which I'm sure every entrepreneur wants in the end. And he started Quiet Light after selling an online publication they built to over 220,000 subscribers. Mark, I was watching a video today of you, I think it was in, I don't know, 2000 six or 2005 giving an industry leader conference you're speaking and uh, since you know you've helped thousands of entrepreneurs sell their business and the most impressive stat about mark is he has six kids that is crazy mark so (laughs) thanks for joining me yeah thanks for having me i'm uh, happy to be here and i would just say that anyone who has two kids is crazy six is easier in my opinion yeah my wife would say three (laughs) but yeah uh that is wild um i don't know how you do it all i'm looking forward to digging deep into valuation, selling the business. So I thought we'd go back to when you sold yours. Um, Go back to that point and what were some of the things that went well? What were some of the mistakes looking back? You're like, was a head slap for you? Well, so, all right, my my story when I sold my business. This was uh, site reference. Yeah, it was site reference and that was back in 2005. And it was actually site reference and tower search uh, combined. There were two Mm. sites combined. Tower search was a... uh, something like a pay-per-click search engine for anyone who's been online long enough to know that there were other options besides Google AdWords and, uh, and Bing and things like that. There used to be a bunch of these smaller pay-per-click search engines. Um, and so I sold the two together. Uh, and when I sold it originally, um, I, I tell this story often at conferences, but uh, I had started the business and um, I got bored of it relatively quickly because I'm an entrepreneur, shiny penny syndrome, something else, let's right. do something different. Uh, and I went to go sell it, and the person who I talked to recommended that I wait uh, for a year. And it was great advice, absolutely phenomenal advice. Why did they recommend that? Uh, because it was too young, and um, I had just started to really realize revenue from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he saw that, and he recommended that that I just wait 12 months, uh, which I did. And um, the the benefit was I went from a valuation of maybe thirty thirty five thousand dollars to uh, his valuation, which was completely unrealistic. And this this is going to be the area where things might might have gone better. Uh, but uh, the, the business sold uh, in the end for uh, between one hundred and two hundred thousand dollars We'll just leave it at that, um, which is a huge, huge difference over the course of a year. I mean, from twenty, thirty thousand dollars to uh, six figure, you know, low six figures, that's that's a huge difference for right. a one year uh, wait. Now, what could have been done better, yeah. and I know this for a fact because I know um, that the person who bought it for me was offered. Um, some money for the business just a little bit after he acquired it. Uh, I should have focused on a few of the things that really help make businesses uh, valuable. The biggest problem I have had with site reference was that I did all the work. Uh, I sold the ads. I uh, wrote most of the articles. I was the editor. I was the programmer. I was the designer. I did everything top to bottom. And so I was trying to sell me. Uh, and if I had uh, outsourced some of that, I could have probably gotten about triple what I got yeah. uh, for the business. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, you know, in that respect, what, why was it? I would expect something with 220,000 subscribers to be valued more. Well, it, it probably should have been. I probably could have done more with it. But also keep in mind, 200, uh, list size can be deceiving. <laughs> so uh, this was back in 2003 when I really worked on it. Uh, and, and built it up. And a lot of those subscribers were not responsive. We had a very low open rate. Mm-hmm. Um, our open rate was 7 or 8%. Uh, 
for every email that went out. And so the list number was impressive and kind of eye popping. But then when you took a look at the stats, then you saw where, where, uh, how active it really was. Um, so the, the way tower search worked with site references, it was a single opt in, uh, sort of service. You could uh, opt into tower search, get all sorts of free comps and free services with tower search. But part of that was that you were a part of the subs- uh, subscription uh, mm-hmm. as well, which is a recipe for low open rates. Yeah. So, Part of you, if you were to go back, you would have systemized some of those positions that you were doing so that when you sell the business, those employees or staff go with it and it's a more sellable asset. What else would you have done differently to increase the value at that time? Well, I mean, that would have easily been the number one thing that yeah, would have, that would have tripled the value. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would have tripled the value. Other than that, it really would, would have been finding ways to add revenue to, to the site. So. Um, I, I think SitePoint really followed a, the model that I should have followed. Um, and SitePoint at that time was in its infancy. They were bigger than us, but uh, they yeah. were in their infancy. And they went to selling their own guides and their own uh, e-books and yeah. uh, bringing in outside writers and, and um, uh, building some value, again, outside, uh, outside of just advertising. So having some sort of paid content would have made a lot of sense uh, for that business. So after you sold, um, your friend approached you. And wanted you to help him sell his. How did that That's go? Right. So my start in the internet, I started in 1998. I think that was the first time I, I designed a website. And it was horrible. Oh. But uh, that was in 1998. And then in college, I got a job with a company called Alabanza Corporation. Uh, and lots of lessons working for them. Because I went through the dot-com bust with Alabanza. Uh, we went from mm. a sales staff. I was part of the sales staff on that uh, with Alabanza Corporation. We went from a sales staff of about 30. And then one day... Everyone was being called into an office, and we went from 30 down to four. Wow. Um, I went from having three accounts to over 200 in one day. Uh, that I had <laughs> Good luck, Mark. Here you go. Right. Well, and then, and then the best part is I had to tell all of those uh, clients that we were doubling the price for their services. <laughs> so wow. It was an absolute nightmare. Uh, well, one of my clients uh, became a good friend. I actually stood up in his wedding, and, and uh, he paid for my honeymoon. And we've been friends. We still talk to this day. Um, he saw that I sold my business and uh, I was taking a year off and uh, he had kicked around selling his company for a while and, and finally asked if I would help him. And I said, sure, let's let's give it a go. Uh, really had no business uh, selling his business. Uh, I, I thought uh, I thought it would be easy and uh, it was hard. But, you know, I so many good lessons from that. Uh, I had so many good lessons from that. I, I was so I had sold my business the year before for six figures I thought I was just going to be able to turn around, start up a new business, and uh, was yours hard to sell? I mean, did mine? you do it by yourself, or did you hire someone at the time? I hired someone for myself. You yes. hired someone, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. and it, it took a long time. Yeah, it took a very long time. It took them uh, eight and a half months, and I had actually fired them. Um, I had I told them that, that I wasn't going to sell it anymore uh, because it was on the market for six plus months, and. Um, and then they called me back. Yeah, they called me back. Somebody I had looked at it before and wanted to make an offer. So mm. I listened and they made an offer. And then about 30 days later, that closed. So with your friend, you're like, I could easily do it in, in sooner than eight months. <laughs> that, was, that was the hope. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, when I looked at the people who had helped me, I, I realized that they didn't have a lot of background in the Internet. You know, they knew some M&A uh, stuff pretty well. And um, they had contracts and new process. But they didn't have the same, even though they The industry knowledge was completely different, is what you're saying. Right, yeah. They, they didn't, I mean, they had some knowledge. They, they, I'm not going to badmouth them here and say that they, they didn't yeah. know anything they were doing. But they didn't have the same uh, base of information that somebody who had built a business online knew. And so I figured that would be an advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it has been uh, an advantage. And it's still, I mean, to this day, it's still kind of our pitch to people is that anyone that works with us, they've bought, they've sold. Uh, and they've started a significant uh, internet enterprise, right. uh, all three uh, of those criteria. What was the hard part? So you went to, to sell your friends. And what were some of the lessons and hard hard parts about that? Oh, boy, that was a while ago. Um, knowing the process, knowing what You always I was remember doing. your first, though, right? Then? Uh, you always remember your first. That you saw <laughs> I remember the first because I got paid the day I went broke. Uh, so <laughs> that, was, that was good. Uh, I think the, the the really hard part was being shown repeatedly over and over again that I didn't know what I was doing. I would get called by somebody. I remember I, I got called by another broker, and he's this was a web hosting company, and, and uh, 
this guy specialized in web hosting. He knew web hosting. And he called me and he said, you're crazy with that price. I'm like, well, no, I don't think I am. And he said, no, I'm in web hosting. I know this price is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, turns out he was right and wrong at the same time. He was right that the multiples uh, that I was asking were way too you high. You asking incre- too many, too much of multiple. Okay. Way too much yeah. for that industry because that's it's not an industry. The, uh, most of the acquisitions within web hosting happen within the web hosting industry, and they actually have lower multiples, hmm. uh, at least they did at the time. Um, but we ended up getting very close to the price that we were asking. Really? So we got kind of the crazy price. <laughs> so it's good that you didn't know as much. The ignorance there helped, yes. Yeah. yeah. So how do you decide what to charge for that, for helping someone? I just went with, with what I paid when I sold my business. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Is there an industry <laughs> standard that people should be looking at? There is. 10% tends to be the industry standard. Um, some brokerages for smaller deals, so sub $100,000 deals, will charge 15 or 20%. We have a minimum uh, at Quiet Light Brokerage for, for ours, and that, that has actually increased over the years. Um, right now it's at 15000 It's a lot of work, you know, to do that. Well, and there's a practical reason there, too. If, if you have a site that's $50,000 and you're charging just 10%, and let's say I'm representing you. Uh, so I'm representing you with a potential $5,000 commission and then representing a $2.5 million listing. Which you're going to spend more time and energy. <laughs> right. I, I feel like I'm an honest person. I feel like I'm going to try and give people the, the right... Uh, you know, same attention, but reality sets in pretty quickly right. that you're going to spend time uh, on the big money one. So the minimum is there to um, to help protect against that. I mean, fifteen thousand is a lot of money, uh, and we completely get it as well. If we're, if I, we're dealing with somebody where their valuation is seventy, eighty thousand, uh, we just explain to them, look, it, it probably doesn't make sense. We get it; uh, that that's fine. But we've had people list with us even with that minimum commission. So, mm-hmm. so what did you do in that year that you took off? Oh, you were trying right. to figure out what the next thing was? Yeah, yeah. So I had, um, what was I doing? I had a business I was starting. It was a forum and article-based site. I had two things. I had a forum and an article-based site that was for people that were dealing with lots of debt issues. Uh, I still actually really like the model here. Uh, I used AdSense and was rotating in people's AdSense IDs. And the idea was if you're in debt, let's all work together and create help uh, resources. And if you create help resources in this discussion format, uh, I'm going to start rotating in your AdSense ID and you're going to be able to earn some money. It's like to a, help pooled, me a pooled yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that was kind of the idea, but the ramp up period was just too long for that. Uh, and then I had um, a uh, review site for affiliates uh, and affiliate products. And it was going to really key in on the JV market. Um, it was back when joint ventures and these one-time mailings and one-time products were um, really popular. And I mean, there, there's still a market for them now, but not like it was back in 2006. Right. So you decided to start Quiet Light Brokerage after you helped your your friend. So then, how did you go out and get new um, business? I mean, because it's a, it's like a two-part marketplace, right? You need buyers and you need sellers. Sure. Yeah. Well, the buyers are easy. Um, yeah. buyers are always easy. And, and, uh, I had somebody who was assisting me at the time. He probably shouldn't, have, definitely shouldn't have been helping me at the time because there was a conflict of interest there. But, uh, uh, I had somebody helping me at the time and he had told me, he said, uh, buyers are easy. Don't worry about the buyers, which is true because buyers are actively looking deal flow is hard to find. And, and, uh, not that you shouldn't cultivate those relationships. You should. Um, and, and we do, but, um, that's the easier side. The harder side was getting people to initially sign up, and you know you're very hungry at that point uh, for any listings. So we would co-broker, you know, ask other people if we could list their listings with us, um, and then I ran an ad in uh, Web Pro News. Um, I bought a dedicated mailing. I think it was like five thousand bucks for it, and uh, it was just a solo email that went out and said, "How much is your website worth? Contact us. We'll we'll tell you how much it's worth." Yeah. And uh, we were able to pick up a handful of clients from that. Um, but you always have the tough question. They would ask, what experience do you have? Uh, and you, you have the, the choice to make. Are you going to be honest or you know, are you going to try and uh, BS them through? And now I would just tell them, I'd say, I just sold my business. I'm starting. I'm new. So I don't have a ton of experience. But we'll go th- uh, through this together. Right. And some people said no. That was fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to hear um, a horror story and also a really positive story as far as the business uh, acquisition. 
Okay, so a horror story. I have a few of those. Um, I mean, anytime you do a, a number of deals, you're going to run into those. Um, let me pick a good one for you. Yeah. Uh, one that, that one that springs to mind. Oh boy, I'm trying to choose between two big ones. You can, um, you can go with both. <laughs> we'll start with because one I think there's lessons to be learned in each of them. I'm assuming so. Well, I mean, they're they're actually kind of similar. Both were just complete fraudsters. I mean, that's that's the biggest uh, danger here, right? Is uh, is fraud. So we had a deal that was done, um, completely done, money exchanged, and we found out after the fact that the seller uh, wasn't just lying; they were forging documents and had lied about or had completely uh, uh, failed to disclose that they had contractors. Uh, that was through a different bank account. They never uh, disclosed any of this information. They had met with a buyer in person uh, and just lied directly to them. Mm -hmm. Found out later that there was actually cases against this person uh, for fraud, uh, and uh, and so we had we worked with the attorney general to help <laughs> in that. Uh, but the the problem there was we had a client who got taken, um, and we were square in the middle of that. And I mean, you, you don't. You don't feel good about that. And uh, we ended up working with that client. There were some valuable assets that they did acquire. Uh, it wasn't a complete fraud business. It was just highly overinflated. Yeah. So we ended up working with them, uh, and and uh, we ended up finding somebody to acquire it for them to help them recoup some of their costs. At uh, no cost, of course, on our side. We, we just worked with them for free um, on that. And they recovered most of their money or a good portion of their money. Uh, from that so that was a horror story did um, they actually forge like tax documents or what type of things were they forging I'm, going with? I'm trying to remember what they exactly what they forged i want to say that they actually did forge the tax documents and the bank returns and we've seen that a few times uh we worked with another company where they they forged outright forged paypal statements mm. and we caught it before the deal closed this was going to be a four million dollar deal wow um, so it would have been a big deal um and our broker, uh, my broker at the time, Amanda, called me one night. We were a couple weeks away from closing. And she said, Mark, this, this doesn't look right. She's like, there's just something I can't place about this, but something isn't right about this, and I don't think that the, the buyer is catching on. And so we talked about it a little bit, and then she kept poking around, and she called PayPal and um, said, can I just verify some of these transaction IDs with you? I want to see if these are, are, are real uh, transaction IDs. And they were cooperative. Um, imagine that PayPal being cooperative. <laughs> anyway, um, and yeah, I've uh, heard some horror stories on that end too. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, and we found out that that it was completely forged uh, documents. So the, uh, they just photoshopped you, it or something. They photoshopped. It. Yeah. They, well, no. They what what you can do. I mean, PayPal statements are usually web based, so you can easily just change the source code mm. uh, and make it look completely legit. Was, so then we started looking into the customer names, calling these companies. And asking for the people that that were listed as the customer names, and none of them worked there, so it was a complete forgery, top to bottom. Wow. Yeah. What do you have to do in that case? Do you have to report this person? I mean, is is there any other action, or is yeah, it just well, like? Yeah, they they were reported uh, appropriately. We actually send out um, something to all the other brokerage firms in the industry to uh, let them know um, that that uh, what what our experience was, and to not work with them. Um, so yeah. It, it, the, it's rare. You know, we, we have not done, uh, dealt with a lot of fraud, thankfully. Yeah. And I think over the years, we've done a good job of filtering that out. People understand that that it's really hard to, to get fraud bias these days. Yeah. It's a lot easier to go with a startup than with, with somebody who's been around as long as we have. Um, but uh, if that ever happens, then we work with the attorney general uh, as needed if, if that's the right avenue right. to go. So what are some of the checks in place that people should look at or that you look at? I mean, is it, okay, you could pull random PayPal IDs or what are some other things that people should look at or that you look at as maybe a big red flag for someone? Well, I'll tell you what, what our process is and what yeah. helps us um, filter out a lot. It's going to be different from, from what a buyer is going to deal with, though. Um, so a buyer is going to want to take a different tack than us. Um, for us, frankly, we just make our, our sellers go through a, a lot of work. Um, they have to produce a lot of documentation for us and answer a lot of questions. It's very, very typical for somebody to do two calls with us that are 45 minutes to an hour answering questions. And then we have them do a written interview, uh, which can be on the short end, 65 questions, on the long end, 100 plus questions. And these aren't just standard qu uh, uh, interviews. We custom yeah. write all of these for every single client. We actually have a policy against 
banking our own questions. We don't want to get lazy with that. We want to be thinking deeply about these. Okay, so what this does is for anyone that is trying to do uh, some sort of forgery uh, or get something passed, it's a lot of work, especially when you can go to another broker who isn't going to do all that. Um, it's a lot of work to do that through us. And so what we've found uh, since we've really started adopting this is we see very, weeds very... people out. It weeds people out naturally. It also gives us a chance to have just a basic sniff test, right? I mean, if, if somebody is uh, sending those documents with financials that are thin or a mess or, or, or just obviously inaccurate, uh, we've seen enough where we can weed those people out pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. From a buyer standpoint, um, I think the biggest thing that a buyer needs to do ask questions, ask a lot of questions, um, background checks. I encourage a buyer and a seller to run background checks on each other. Mm. And we've had horror stories on the buy side. With, really? with, there's some buyers out there who are just mentally mentally ill, and I'm not saying that in a disparaging way towards them. I, they are actually mentally ill um, and uh, have some issues. We've run into a few of those people, and any broker in the industry knows. <laughs> we all know the same people um, that, that fall into that category. So running background checks is a great idea. Um, with tax returns, uh, get a, uh, was it a 40, 4506T form, which verifies that the tax return is accurate. Um, with bank statements, uh, you know, do what you can to confirm uh, with the bank if possible about the balances so that those aren't being forged. All those things are just smart things to do um, and will will help. Um, will help. What have, what have you found, Mark, are some key questions that are important that the seller answers um, I mean, it, besides the obvious ones, right? I mean, the obvious, the ones that maybe other people wouldn't even think of that you, they're on your questionnaire and you're like, it really points to whether they're, you know, to their business or something that, that's working or not working in their business. I mean, it depends so much on the business itself. So if, if somebody so has e-commerce, let's say, I don't know well, if that's too broad also. Well, let me give you one for, for one that I recently sold. We actually just closed this uh, a few days ago, and, yeah. and uh, the business was on a sharp decline. Uh, and, and so naturally with that, you look at why. And, and you start by asking why. That's the obvious question. right? Well, why is the, the, the decline? But then not stopping there. Um, you know, the, the answer, and this is almost always the answer, well, I'm not spending as much time on it. Okay, well, now that branches into probably five different questions. Well, why aren't you spending as much time on it? If you can recover this, why aren't you recovering this? Um, are there any other issues that, that we should be looking at here? And, and with this one, sure, there, there were some other issues that, uh, you know, some competitiveness with, uh, with the product and competitors starting to eat away uh, at various places. Uh, one of the products started having higher levels of returns than other products. So there's a lot of reasons that went into that. And what I'm looking for more than the explanation, I'm looking for the understanding on the part of the owner and the level of detail. Does he have a good handle on what he's talking about? If somebody's just glossing over something, you're going to get glossed over answers. Well, I'm not working on it that much. We just aren't working the business as much. It's got lots of potential. Uh, you just need to be doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe not. Let, let's start to get a little bit deeper in here because usually it's not just yeah. one. Then it's a, why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z if you know that's the problem? And that's a, it's a common question, and and you know th there's no single wrong answer. I mean, people will people will not grow their business. People will not do the obvious things all the time. Um, I talked to a buyer who bought something for me back in October. I was just talking to him on Monday, and uh, he was uh, mentioning something that that he used to grow the business. Um, and he was wondering, he said, do you have other businesses that have the same deficit? He found a deficit in this company that he was able to exploit to, to grow it. Um, what do you mean in, by know, deficit? Uh, something that could be improved, a growth. Oh, factor. I got you. Okay. So you I don't that. want to get into his strategy. For sure. Uh, for sure. But uh, he said, are there other companies uh, like this? And I said, absolutely. Said, you know, people, when you own a business, it's easy to not improve some of the obvious things because you just get comfortable with it. Uh, you get comfortable with what you're doing and... If, as long as the money's rolling in the same way it has been, uh, a lot of people are, are comfortable with that. I know I, I, I do the same with the quiet light. So, yeah. What are some general things people do? Because that's a, obviously from a buyer's perspective, you're looking at those, the big potential, right? Because you're buying it on a multiple. You want to improve it. What are some things that you've seen the buyers do out of the gate that's really improved the, the value of their purchase? Sure. I think there's a number of things you can do. What I recommend to people is to... Have something, have something where you can have a strong suit, and it can either be SEO, paid marketing, 
conversion rate optimization. Uh, other things that I've seen people do is if you have logistics in place, like a warehouse, there's a great opportunity there. Uh, if you're if you're doing traditional e-commerce where you're doing some of your own fulfillment, just assuming you're not using Amazon FBA. If you have a, a really nice ERP uh, backend and software to manage your, your uh, inventory and order processes, then you get some some uh, um, uh, overlap there where you can bring those advantages to a new business. Um, so the, the most it varies from from person to person, from buyer to buyer. Um, but I've seen all of those strategies played uh, before. You know, the conver- conversion rate optimization would be a great example. You have a low conversion rate. You you're good at running tests. You know how to run tests efficiently. Uh, and you can grow something from, you know, a 0.5% conversion rate to a 1.5 conversion rate. That's a huge, huge amount of growth. Um, funnel marketing would be another thing. Uh, taking a site that doesn't have any funnels, if you know funnel marketing well, uh, you can build in funnel marketing into that and uh, grow a business that way as well. So it depends on the strengths of the person. Yeah. Have you found anything in particular, like a trend specifically in e-commerce that pe- that's working really well out of those you know, SEO, conversion rate, or whatever, or, or funnel, what are people doing now that is, you know, across the board? Is there anything that they're doing really well now in e-commerce specifically? Uh, in e-commerce specifically, I think it falls more into um, people that are good with vendor relationships or might have vendor relations. People that are good with, um, with, with being able to uh, manage inventory and those processes, mm-hmm. uh, or people who are very good on Amazon and know the Amazon environment and ecosystem well. Um, it tends to be more uh, e-commerce tends to be more of a um, uh, people who have a better familiarity with traditional business tend to do well with e-commerce and mm-hmm. and, and usually cause those businesses to grow pretty pretty rapidly. Um, Any red flags like buyers should look at when purchasing an e-commerce business specifically? Uh, lots of red flags, but it would depend on the business itself. Um, I think. Um, Let's get into some of the red flags. Some of the things that I would watch out for with with uh, an e-commerce business would be the uniqueness of the product. Uh, I'm not a fan of dropship uh, companies uh, for the most part. There mm-hmm. are some that that can be run well and uh, have some good advantages, but you want to have some defensibility. I think with e-commerce, the, the biggest problem is it's just can how someone easy. knock you off? Yeah, yeah, it's so easy to to have your market flooded. Um, so that would be. That, that that would be probably the biggest red flag I would be looking for is what's the defensibility of the product. Yeah. Um, anyone who has their own brand, that's a good thing. We we like to see that. Um, what's been the yeah. trend of? I mean, you see a lot of businesses come come through your uh, uh, your desk, and um, what's been the trend with people starting or in selling e commerce businesses specifically? Has it been the same? Has it been increased lately? We're seeing an uptick in it right now. Definitely with Amazon as well, we're seeing an uptick. Uh, I wrote an article on this a while ago just trying to speculate why are we seeing so many Amazon businesses hit the marketplace. And it's not, not just quite like brokerages, all the brokerages out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone's seen this uptick in uh, Amazon businesses. And I think part of it's just the growth of that marketplace um, has been so phenomenal um, that we're nat- now naturally at that two, three, four year window when people had started their businesses two, three, four years ago. It's a popular time to look at selling uh, a business. Mm-hmm. Um, starting and selling, um, we are seeing that, uh, I still hesitate to say that most of our clients, uh, started their business with the intent to sell. Um, I think most started it with the intent to, to just grow it and hockey stick it. But, uh, um, you know, again, uh, shiny, shiny penny syndrome, <laughs> we all get it. And about two to three years, most entrepreneurs get bored and want to do something else. So you're finding kind of the life cycle of it is they've had the business for two or three years. Yeah, yeah, two to three years is when is probably the beginning part. So if you look at like a bell curve, uh, you'll probably see the heart of it being yeah. uh, the beginning of the bell curve being around two to three years, and then seven eight years on the other uh, part of the uh, the heart of the bell, um, and then after that it tails off. Um, so. Have you given that advice to the same advice you got when you were going to sell your site? Is just to wait? Have you told people just wait? We tell the majority of people that we talk really. To. Yeah, uh, the vast majority of people that come into evaluation get homework from us before they sell. Now, not not everyone takes it. Some people want to sell now. Um, the person that we just closed, um, that, that I just closed the business for this past week, I told him uh, to go away and to, to work on his business. And he didn't want to, um, <laughs> go which is away. fine. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I told him to go away. But my, <laughs> my broker Joe tells a story, uh, and he tells it so flattering, right? And <laughs> the, I'll tell you the, the, how he tells it, and I'll tell you the truth behind the story. Oh, yeah. um, he came to me to sell his business, uh, uh, Pure Stat, uh, years ago, and and uh, I remember looking at this thing, thinking it was an absolute mess at the time, and that he wasn't going to get a ton of value out of it. So I told him that I said, "You're not going to get a ton of value. You should go out. You should fix it." Uh, and then, you know, come back to me at that point. And, you know, he tells a story like, you know, Mark wasn't pushy. He didn't, you know, he cared more about my business than anything else. And, and, uh, he didn't even bother to follow up with me six months down the road. The truth is I was kind of lazy. <laughs> That's really what was happening there. Um, but it, it, it worked out. I mean, he ended up uh, getting a lot more value out of his business because of that. So we tell a lot of people that, yeah. Um, I yeah, because, I mean, if you look back at yours, if someone would have told you to systemize it or whatever the case is, you could have tripled the value. What's some of the common homework you give people? Uh, oftentimes, it's grow, grow the revenue and the earnings again. People, um, people come to us after things start to go bad or after they start to get burned out and are focusing on another project. And once they start focusing on that other project, right. sales start to go down. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been working, so I'm, I actually just, I followed up with a guy two days ago who I first talked to nine years ago um, when he was going to buy the business that he now owns. And then he contacted me a year and a half ago about potentially selling. Hmm. I did a valuation for him and I said, here's where your value is now. If you were to do X, Y, and Z, we could get your valuation up to this. I would recommend waiting and holding. We were going to list it this quarter and he just got back to me and said, hey, business is going great. I'm just going to kind of ride this out. My response was, absolutely. If your business is growing, if, if your revenue is going up, your earnings are going up, and more importantly, if you're enjoying the work at that point, you're only adding value to the business. So right. hang on until you get to the point where you think, okay, I'm about to get burnt out. I'm about to start seeing a decline because I'm not going to put more time into it. Yeah. That's the time to sell. Yeah. yeah. Are there any specifics you could share on what you told them to do? I'd have not, to look back. I don't. I don't remember actually. I know. I mean, because uh, obviously the homework that he did that you you told him uh, kind of reinvigorated him and started growing the business. Yeah, so. he he had shut down a few product lines uh, that were just more cumbersome to to uh, to fulfill and uh, orders to fulfill. So he had he started paring back on some of his inventory, shutting down a few of his um, uh, product lines, and I told him that he should probably add those back in. Uh, and then I I think there was a workload issue on that, and so I. Uh, I'd have to go back. If, if there was a workload issue, I would recommend that he hire somebody part-time um, to help with that mm -hmm. so that it's more transferable for the yeah. next seller. Yeah, because you become almost like a, a trusted business advisor in this circumstance because it benefits much. both parties. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. we want people to think uh, think of us that way. I mean, that, that's why I hire uh, entrepreneurs. You know, Joe, uh, Jason, Darren, Brian, they're all people that, that work with me. They're all entrepreneurs who have done this before. Um, I... I the way I look at, at anyone's online business is that uh, selling is such an end of life sort of concern for that business, right? It's a one time thing. So I don't want you to just go out and, and do it without being well prepared. Now, you might know that you're ready to, to sell the business. And if you are, fine. Uh, you know, even if you get a little bit less, if, if you're ready to move on, fine. Yeah. But I don't want you to sell the business and then later on think, like me, I could have gotten triple for, <laughs> for what I sold. And I right. wish I did. Uh, that would have been uh, very helpful. What percentage of people, Mark, um, sell with you and then turn around and then buy something from you? I have no idea. Is there a large have, percentage? Uh, we yeah. do have it. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about, so the, you talked about the some of the horror stories, right? What's been a uh, great story as far as acquisition goes? Sure. So um, I'll go with a recent one. I worked with a woman uh, who had a phenomenal business, um, one of the most organized businesses I've ever seen. Uh, she did a, so many things right uh, that, <laughs> frankly, made made my job significantly more easy. Um, she was just she had all of her finances in order. Uh, she had her processes set up really, really well documented, uh, and she had. She, she knew her business inside and out. There just weren't any loose ends. Uh, she didn't want to list it publicly, so I approached 10 buyers with it. Uh, I found a buyer who was also phenomenal to work with. Um, I actually did a case study on her, uh, on our blog, on how to transfer a business because she just did it so well. I want to do a case study with, um, with uh, the buyer because he did so many things right. Well, one of the things that he did right, which I, I'll tell anyone that's looking at buying, mm -hmm. he understood that he was buying something that somebody had poured a lot of energy into 
And so he was very respectful of that to the point where when we did our first conference call after the offer was accepted, he took just one moment to say, I want to thank you for selling me your business. It was such a simple little gesture to say, I want to thank you for selling me your business, but it meant so, so much. And, um, you know, we, we always think about the numbers. We think about the metrics. Deals and offers are made on that, but they're closed based off the goodwill and the trust between the buyer and the seller. Yeah. You have to have that. And so from a buying standpoint, when you're buying, uh, you want to be building that up as much as possible, as much goodwill as you can right. so that you can spend it if you need to uh, with, with a more contentious issue. What did she do so well in the transfer side of things? Uh, again, it was just organization. She did a few things that were very original, though. Um, so one of the things she did, uh, passwords is often a, a difficult thing. Uh, you know, you usually get this really long list of passwords uh, that you have to keep a Word document on. What she did is she created a, an account with LastPass, a yeah. unique with, uh, account with LastPass, yeah. and then just transferred over the LastPass account. I can't live without LastPass. <laughs> I, neither can I. Uh, the other thing that she did is she created a unique uh, Chrome user and uh, gave uh, login and gave him the login for that Chrome user. So when he had LastPass and Chrome combined, he would open it up. He would have 10 tabs that opened up to all of his most important pages. And with LastPass, he'd get logged into all of them mm. automatically. And so it gave him access within... Seconds, to, seconds yeah it was brilliant what other softwares and tools do you like and use like you mentioned LastPass. what are some other ones because at this point you again with also having six kids you have to have some kind of system in place or there would be chaos <laughs> everywhere uh, you know I'm, i i love to just play around with different software so i change all the time todoist is one of those ones that i, I fall back on quite mm -hmm. a bit mm -hmm. um i love to do a slack i've been using that with quiet light uh brokerage um mm -hmm. i like uh What's the name of the uh, Lucid Charts um, for diagramming out uh, things? I, I, I I've not that. seen that. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been helpful for me just to diagram out ideas, flow chart uh, ideas as well. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't be able to live without Google Apps. Right. What it's about like, on the e-commerce front? What have you seen that the popular uh, software products that people are using? Um, Shopify. I mean, hands down. Uh, it's the majority of uh, people want to buy on Shopify uh, and use Shopify. Big commerce would be up there as well um, as far as being popular. But Shopify is hands down the, the runway leader for uh, popularity. So that one, that lady was a, a success story. What What's another one? Uh... Sure. I had a guy, uh, I'll go back a few years. Um, I like the success story because he had a good reason for selling uh, he did a good job uh, with a dropship company, actually. Uh, here I was disparaging them, but he did a good job with a dropship company. He was selling basketball hoops and other sports equipment like that um, to both gyms and also homes. Uh, and, you know, basketball hoops is not something that you can really carry in inventory very easily, so it made sense to dropship. You have like 100 in your bedroom. Yeah, <laughs> they don't fit. <laughs> right. Be, be lots of fun for the kids. But um, So he, what he did is he created a really cool – he was on um, – I think it was on Yahoo shopping cart. Um, so this was a few years ago. He created a really nice um, uh, shopping uh, like engine. You could put in, here's what I'm looking for, and it would narrow down your product uh, list from like 3,000 down to 30. It was a nice little distinguishing factor for his business. Uh, what I liked about his story, again, well organized. He knew his business well. His financials were well uh, prepared. Um, his reason for selling was solid. Um, he was starting a new business where he needed uh, access to capital. Uh, he had already raised a lot of money for this new business. His was the last portion that needed to go in. And so he knew his number. He knew what he needed to get out of it. We were able to bring it to market, find a buyer, wrap it up fairly quickly, and he was able to move on uh, to his new venture. Um, yeah. And that was a fairly short and quick, painless process. Hmm. Uh, what are some crazy reasons you've heard for people selling? crazy reasons for people selling you know i i wouldn't call it crazy i, I i've had a lot of sad situations mm. you know divorces i think probably the, the hardest one that i've run into was a, a guy who had bought a business he was planning to run it for about seven eight years and then sell it and retire but he had uh, come down with a terminal illness mm. and wanted to spend time with his wife um you know so what, what I often explain at, at conferences is the, the most over-asked question from buyers is, uh, why are you selling? And the most dishonest, frequently dishonest answer is, why are you selling? 
We right. usually don't know why someone is selling, and we'll ask it anyways, but we really don't know why. Yeah. But for most people, and, and I'd be of the same viewpoint, for most people it doesn't make sense to sell, and it shouldn't make sense to sell. I don't think financially it makes sense to sell if you have a good business. So what, why would you then sell? It has to be some sort of change of life or change of uh, scenery sort of situation yeah. that's dramatic enough where you're going to make what is essentially not as financially of a good decision. Um, you know, because you're going to, best case scenario, let's say that you have a great phenomenal business and that's e-commerce. 3.5 to 4 would be the top that we've seen uh, from that. And you have to be growing pretty rapidly at that point. It doesn't make sense. If, if you're going to be growing rapidly, you, you're going to make more than that over the course of three, four, five years. Um, so, yeah, it's got to be some sort of some uh, sort of major situation. So divorces and and uh, separations, partnership disputes, those those are kind of the sad. Uh, uh, yeah, situations. you see people all different life circumstances come into play. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had a crazier story. You know, when I was no. working for all the bonds, I lost a sale because my client was abducted by aliens or supposed <laughs> <laughs> um, that that would actually qualify for a crazier story than this, but uh, it's a different, totally different business. How did you communicate with him? <laughs> well, actually, I, I read about it in a paper because um, he was well known. He, he had raised something like forty five million dollars. Whoa! And uh, and then he the just, paper said he was abducted by aliens. But the paper was like, "What happened?" I forget his name even now, but it was like, "What what happened to this guy?" Because he was known uh, in Silicon Valley. <laughs> And uh, he had gone off the deep end and was claiming that he was abducted by aliens. So. <laughs> that is weird. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, Mark, I want to talk about valuation for a second. I figured we could talk about one of the, it is a case study because you have, obviously, people can go on your site and they can go on Quiet Light Brokerage and they can go to listings. They can see whatever uh, is listed there. Um, and so I pulled up a few e-commerce ones. Um so I figured instead of just talking, you know, like you said, it just depends on valuation. Um, and I know you can't disclose uh, specific numbers and things because there's non disclosures, but there's an e-commerce business here on the site. Maybe it's not going to be there much longer. Um, someone's going to buy it, but 10 hour weekly workload. Um, and it's the description is as launched in late 2014, this 95% Amazon jewelry fitness brand is operated in less than 10 hours per week. It's grown over 340% in the last 12 months. Um, all these things sound like, uh, you know, a seller is just, or a buyer is, um, lighting up inside with, with those, uh, with that sentence. So talk about how, you know, how maybe just in general, how it comes to the valuation it looks like the multiple is 2.13. Like how do you come to the multiple and the valuation of some, some business like this? Sure. So, uh, coming up with a valuation, uh, is always a bit of a mix of what is the market willing to bear? Um, and then also, um, what is that? What are the owner's requirements or expectations or goals? Uh, as I just said, some, it doesn't always make sense financially for somebody to sell. So you have to ask, well, uh, what are your other goals right. in selling? Quick sale or right? Ten hours week? a week. It's growing three hundred forty percent. Like, right? Wh why sell it? Right, right. right. And I, I don't know specifically what the reason is for this person selling. I'm actually looking to see if I can find it real, real quick. Uh, so they're they're saying uh, time constraints um, with uh, other activities that they have. Do they have seven um, kids or something? Or no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, possibly, who knows? Uh, there is something in there about a baby, so uh, possibly. Um, uh, but uh, as far as coming up with evaluation for a business like this, uh, it will be a mixture uh, of that. Now, 2.13 multiple uh, means that there's going to be something that, that we are also looking at and probably saying there's some things that a buyer needs to account for with this business. Maybe it's defensibility of the product line. Maybe there's there's something else that we're seeing. Maybe it's just young, uh, which is very much the case. And I think that's actually the case with this one, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that it's just because uh, if it was older and maybe more unique, then it would warrant like a three times or, or a bigger exactly. multiple. Exactly. Yep. And I'm looking at this one right here, launched late in 2014. So uh, that's definitely uh, going to be a, a discount. We recommend people wait at least three years before selling. There's a discount under three years. And even if you're like at 36 months, you're not going to get the best multiple you can possibly get. Um, so anyways, for valuations, it's going to be a mixture of both what's the market going to bear uh, and then also what are your expectations. If this owner is really just hey, I got to get rid of this business. I love it, but I just can't do it and I want to sell it before uh, it kills me and then I lose all value, then we're going to recommend a lower price. 
Um, it always has to be within what we think for market expectations reasonably within or close to market expectations in order for us to sell it. So I won't be putting up a 10 times multiple or anything like that unless we, unless, unless it really justified, but I can't imagine that. What type of businesses have the biggest multiples? SaaS tends to have the biggest multiples SaaS. at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, SaaS content sites, re recurring subscription revenue um, tends to have the, the highest multiples. Mm -hmm. So for something like this, you figure out, I mean, obviously the, the nuances about why they're selling and, and all the, the background, but then you obviously the, the hard numbers, you have the income, which in this case, in the revenue, which is 411,000, income is 126. And then it's a multiple off of the income of 2.13 times for this particular business. That's right. And so I've, I've got a love hate relationship with multiples, more of a hate relationship than a love relationship with them. Um, they're, they're very static statistic, uh, which I, I, I have troubles with all the time. Um, I would just encourage people don't get hung up on the multiples. They, they don't tell you much at all. Um, they just tell you what the last 12 months were. They tell you nothing about the direction uh, of that. Um, uh, of what that income is and no businesses well I won't say no business most businesses don't stay flat at, from year after year they're growing or they're shrinking and you don't get that that idea from the multiple alone but yeah for, for this one we, we always do base it off the last 12 months but a lot goes into um, that multiple itself so for this particular business um, whatever you can share what would you say someone can do what are the potential areas like so a buyer is looking at it like okay it's a 2.13. Obviously, they want to recoup their money as fast as possible. Where do you see the potential areas for for a buyer for this business? Yeah, for this business, I mean, it's so young um, that it's still in its initial growth curve. So uh, with a business like this, there isn't actually a lot to do initially to be able to recoup your money faster, especially at the low multiple that it's at. Um, you have to support it and you have to, as a buyer, do your upfront research to make sure that it's going to continue growing and not tank after you buy it. And obviously, we wouldn't sell it if we think it's going to do that. But um, buyers need to do that research independently to see if, if uh, they agree with us on that. Uh, other than that, you know, just looking at this, they've added a lot of uh, SKUs within just the past few months. Uh, and um, those are just starting to, uh, to hit. And with young companies like this, oftentimes, especially e-commerce, that's what it comes down to is starting to build up that inventory and that, that product offering. And it naturally will grow the business on its own. Mm -hmm. Anything else that a untrained eye wouldn't see, like a trained eye like yourself sees with this type of listing? Uh, if I knew it better, I could probably uh, give better, uh, better, better advice, but I don't know this listing yeah. uh, terribly well. It just says he's identified and opened many paths to growth that require minimal working capital. Um, yeah, so it does say the reasons for the sale are time constraints with a full-time job and a nine-month-old baby. So this person's operating this with a full-time job. It seems. Right, right. And I think for a lot of people, they don't want to leave the security of that uh, uh, full-time job. Um, they start these things, especially with Amazon businesses. This happens a lot where you start something on the side thinking it's going to be side income. And if you do well on Amazon, and uh, I'm sure people that are going to Prosper Shore are familiar with this, sometimes the growth from Amazon is, is aggressive to the point of being almost uh, difficult to keep up with. Uh, it happens to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the majority of e-commerce sellers on Amazon started with an e-commerce business and they thought, I'm going to add Amazon as a side channel. Right. <laughs> Next thing you know, Amazon is their main channel uh, right. of revenue. Yeah. So. Um, and then what about, there's another one, the nutritional supplement business, worldwide growth structure in place. This is a three-year-old nutritional supplement business has a worldwide network in place ready for substantial growth. It started in 2013. Um, this company had amazing results until a partnership went bad. Uh, without any direction or attention, there has been a serious drop in sales. Um, this one has, says revenue at 156, and then the income was 107, and it has a, a lower multiple of 1.85. Right, and that would be because of the, the decline. Um, declines are obviously a major, major uh, drawback on any business. Um, uh, we always recommend people try and course correct if they can. Uh, but if they can't, if they if it's not within their capacity either mentally or otherwise, uh, yep. maybe they need some outside resources. Then you sell and you sell quickly before you get out ahead of your valuation because it it tanks very very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that that would be the main driver for a low multiple on this. Um, I would imagine one of the 
most frequent questions you get, maybe not, you could tell me is um, the financing piece uh, yes. from a buyer. Um, how do how is that usually handled? You know, uh, someone well, does have a briefcase full of two hundred thousand dollars cash, like laying under their bed or something. Sure. Well, I, I mean, we do actually have a number of cash buyers. Cash is obviously the preferred way cash to go. Cash is king. Yeah. <laughs> cash is king always. And if if anyone is wondering why, it's much easier to negotiate with somebody who can pay right away than waiting for a bank who you have no control over. Um, SBA financing would be the number two um, source of financing. Mm-hmm. About half of our deals are done through SBA financing. Um, and then outside of that, it, it's usually a mix. Does uh, a business have to be of a certain age to qualify for that, or how does that work? It has to be three years uh, old, have three tax returns on file. Mm-hmm. It's got to be U.S.-based mm-hmm. uh, in order to qualify for SBA. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, it's not terribly difficult to qualify for SBA. Um, and you actually get uh, better multiples. for So for a seller, your drawback in accepting an SBA loan is that it's kind of a hairy process, which is frustrating, and there's no guarantee that it's going to get approved. Hmm. Um, How long does it take, is, typically? I mean, it's probably differs. But I mean, is it, if we're talking a year, are we talking six months, two years? So if you talk to an SBA lender, they'll tell you three to four weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we'll push practice. us through in four weeks, and then right, a exactly. year later, you're like, what? Uh, three to four months is more typical from mm-hmm. our experience. I'm going through one right now. We're on month six. Um, wow. So, uh, there's and that, just, that just hit, you have to wait on that before you close on the deal. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, really. Right. I mean, uh, there are some things you can do. You can have some things prepared and make sure that your tax returns are ready. Make sure that you have your profit and loss statements ready. If you run multiple businesses through one entity, make sure you have tax returns for everything and they match. Uh, I'm sorry, profit and loss statements for uh, everything and that they match your tax returns, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, be organized with, with SBA and you can push it through a bit faster. But you're still waiting on other people who are not motivated to get the deal done like you are. With a cash deal, can people get a, a discount on that? Like on the price typically? Or how does that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if, if I have two offers and one's a cash uh, deal and let's say it's even 10% or 15% less, uh, I'm going to recommend to my client that they take that cash deal. Mm-hmm. Um, unless we're really low on price on both of them, but the cash deal is guaranteed. It's clean. It's fast. Uh, I mean, you can do a cash deal on a you know mid-sized six-figure business. You can do a cash deal in four weeks um, without too much difficulty. Hmm. So, what does the SBA require as a down payment typically? Good question. So SBA uh, will do depends on the size of the deal. They'll do either um, they'll either finance up to eighty percent of it mm-hmm. if it's I forget what the line is. It's, I think it's around five hundred thousand dollars. I can look this up later. Anything before like five hundred or below, they'll do for twenty. I believe it's five hundred thousand. Yeah, okay. or maybe it's between either five hundred or seven hundred thousand. I have an article on our site that, that actually yeah. goes over this. Uh, but they'll either do eighty percent or they'll do seventy five percent. So for the larger uh, loans, they'll do seven, up to seventy five percent. From the buyer, they require ten percent down. Now that obviously leaves either ten or fifteen uh, percent. So it gets free money. What happens? To that? <laughs> yeah, so that that's usually picked up by the seller. Um, it's very unfavorable rates for the oh, seller. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, SBA often likes to see the seller carry. It's not required in yeah. all situations, though. So they have some skin in the game type of thing for it to do well. Yeah, it, that the bank likes to see that. Um, I encourage buyers to be willing to put up the 20, 25% because, frankly, the terms that a seller has to take on their portion. Are terrible. Um, they can't receive any payments on their loans for the first two years. Yeah. So, if I'm selling a business and I'm carrying, you want to lock up ten percent or fifteen percent of your business, yeah. Right, and I'm not. I'm not going to see any. I'm not going to see my first payment until month twenty-five, uh, at at best, and then it's on a six-year amortization schedule. So it, it's just. Yeah, you don't recommend it to your to your sellers. It's a raw deal. Yeah. yeah, and and most sellers look at that like, yeah, right. I'm not going to get that money. <laughs> so. Uh, if you're able to do the 20, 25% down or keep that, that uh, seller note down, you just have way more negotiating power. Uh, and you're still getting paid back within the first year on your own personal uh, down payment. So, What are the interest rates now on the SBA loan? Do you know? They're going up. Um, the last rate that I saw was 6.45. Mm-hmm. So they are going up. What, why, what are the reasons they reject people? Besides, I mean, obviously the time, like all those requirements are met. Why do they reject people? 
for that. Uh, it's be... more on the buyer, uh, more on the buyer side than the seller side. Yeah. Um, if the multiple is too rich, then they'll reject um, the reject the deal, or they'll only finance up to a portion of the deal. So um, let's say that you you have an offer for eight hundred thousand. They might do a valuation and say, well, we only think this is worth six fifty. It's not terribly common. Their multiples are generally friendlier than, than what the uh, uh, brokering industry has. Right. Uh, on the other hand, buyers, if they think a buyer is overextended with loans, um, the last deal that I had where a buyer got rejected, uh, he got rejected because he had just completed two other deals within the last six months. Mm. And so the had SBA a lot of credit them, out. Uh, yeah, they just said, you're, you're over leveraged. We, we feel a little un, uh, uneasy about how much leverage you have out there right now. Yeah. Uh, even though he's a good good buyer and has some financial backing outside of that, they they still rejected it. Yeah. So it's it's more on the buyer than anything else. Yeah. So those are the probably the typical, right? The SBA loan, the cash. What's some creative financing solutions that you've seen work out for people? Entrepreneurs, um, they probably well, get creative. You know, like if uh, yeah, maybe uh, SBA rollover for business. Yeah, rollover for business startups. I think is one of the more creative uh, ways to, to finance a, a purchase. And a rollover for a business startup uses your. Uh, retirement account, um, and um, it's a little bit of a convoluted process. But uh, what you do is you form a C corp, okay, uh, and then you uh, open up a self-directed IRA, and then that self-directed goes into your C corp, and now your C corp can make acquisitions with your retirement funds. There's tons of red tape involved. There are companies out there that specialize in this and can make sure that you pass with uh, flying colors um, with it. Um, but it's a nice way to tap into your your retirement account uh, to be able to acquire a business. The problems with it are that you have to be a C corp. C corps are uh, not as tax friendly, um, and uh, the other problem is that that the money has to stay in your retirement account, right? So if you're growing the value of your business, it's growing the value of your retirement account. You're mm -hmm. not necessarily going to be able to take that and buy a vacation home uh, without without having right. the, the early withdrawal penalty. It's just uh, a creative way that they can finance it through means that they already have, but they can't access right now, type of thing. But then they yeah, won't be able to you, access it now, anyways, when they grow their business. You you can though. I mean, what you could do is you could you could do a rollover for business startup. You could acquire the company. You could refund or grow your retirement account yeah. to basically refund whatever you use to acquire the company. Yeah. And you could take your self-directed IRA, divest in your own corporation, change out of that to an S corp. I mean, you can do a number of things like that to to uh, use yeah. it as a temporary loan. Uh, I personally would hesitate to do it because I just don't want to mess with my retirement. Uh, but if you, I mean, if you have, you know, three, four, or five million dollars in retirement, and you want to stake four hundred thousand or five hundred thousand. Yeah. It's not that bad of a, a yeah. risk. Yeah, uh, that might be worth it. When does when have you seen a case actually of someone seller financing it, or a portion of it? A portion of it is it's How not uncommon. Is that? Yeah, it's not uncommon at all. Um, I, I would say. What does that look like? Uh, yeah, I, I would say the majority of our deals or. Yeah, the majority, over over 50% uh, have some element of seller financing. Um, it's typically limited to anywhere from 10 to 30%, depending on the business itself. Um, some businesses you will not be able to get seller financing because they're just good, solid businesses, and that, that seller just won't take it. Um, but you're typically looking at notes of about two years at the, at the top end. Um, it's really hard to convince a seller to do seller financing because there's just there's no guarantee on that. Right? There's just no, there's no note that you can really secure it against, or no asset that you can secure it against, mm -hmm. other than the business which they're trying to get rid of. Right. Why right? would they so, do it then? Uh, because they don't have too many other options, right? Um, or if they get enough money at close where they feel decent about it, um, what, what I tell sellers frequently is uh, the money you get at closing is guaranteed. The money you get in your first payment is uh, pretty much guaranteed second payment and so on and so forth but your percentages go down the further you get out really and so just kind of have Do people default on it or or what why, what were the reasons honestly not often but okay. again from the seller viewpoint you just they, want they, your money right and then there's that that re reality of there's no guarantee how do i guarantee this uh the best guarantee that you can have um i know escrow.com has uh, a domain holding service so they'll put the domain in escrow uh, that's actually a pretty decent uh, uh piece to use and we use that with a lot of our seller notes yeah um, to help secure the note. Uh, we don't see defaults at a high rate at all, though, surprisingly. Yeah. yeah. Mark, thank you so much for this, by the way. Everyone should check out quietlightbrokerage.com. I feel like I can go through all these listings and have you analyze them all day long. It would be fun. Um, be fun. What have we not talked about with Quiet Light Brokerage that you think would be important? 
Um, you, you know, I think the, the uh, biggest thing I like to let people know through any of these conversations and in conferences and anytime we get to talk to people is that uh, don't don't wait too long before talking to a broker about evaluation. And I know that sounds like a sales pitch, but I've already said, and I, I will stand by this uh, all day long. I don't care whether or not somebody sells their business. In fact, I think financially it makes sense to hang on to the business, but leave your options open. Uh, you and I actually already talked about this earlier. Uh, the things that we do see as far as why people are selling are life-changing situations. Um, they are you things just that never know. You just never know. Yeah. And you don't want me to look at your business and say you should wait two years if that doesn't really suit your plans. Um, doing evaluation now, having us just take a look at the business allows you to identify how much it's worth now, what it could be in the future, and maybe some things that you should be looking at and planning for in the future. Frankly, most of the advice that we give is good business advice anyways for just day-to-day -day business advice. Mm -hmm. um, and we love having those conversations. So my, my biggest advice to people is have a sense for this. Just have it in the back of your mind. We understand that you're running your business to grow it. Great. Keep that up. Uh, and and uh, just have this in the back of your mind so that your options are open if you need it. So, Mark, where should people go on your site? Uh, I guess they just go to quietlightbrokerage.com and then the upper right-hand corner. You actually, it's a free evaluation. A free evaluation. It's a free it's a free valuation. We're actually going to add a paid valuation. Oh, that's now. generous. I mean, it takes time and energy on your part to do those things. Well, we've had people that actually say they don't want a valuation because they don't want to use our time. So we're actually going to be adding a paid valuation here soon. Um, it's not going to be all that much different from what we give away for free, though. So um, really do you know? feel free to fill out the form. Let When, when uh, we reach out to you, let us know that I'm not interested in selling right now. That's yeah, fine. they don't want to do it because they don't want to waste your time. And right. they don't want to do it till they're serious, so they don't do it. But then probably right now they should do it just to get a sense of where they're at or something like that. Right. They end up wasting their time uh, down the road uh, eventually by, by not knowing the mechanics of what makes their business valuable early on. So, yeah. Any other posts that, people, that we should point people towards? Because I know you have a lot of informational posts on your site that I've read that are very helpful. Any ones in particular for the e-commerce folks to check out on, on your site? Sure. If you go to the resources section on our website, um, there's a couple of really good articles. One of the things that we talk about, I know it's not exciting, but knowing the difference between accrual and cash basis accounting. Um, if you're uh, going to Prosper Show, I'm going to use this as an example in my presentation of uh, how uh, we have saw, I think the valuation swing was over $200,000 based off wow. accounting methodology alone. That's crazy. It is. And it's one of those simple things that you can do to make sure that you're getting the most value out of your site. Uh, so take a look at that article. It's a very short article that explains the difference. Um, and then yeah. Joe Valley wrote a, a pretty nice comprehensive guide on how to sell an Amazon business. Um, so take a look at that. And then take a look at the blog where we're constantly adding new stuff uh, yeah, on the I'm blog that's very the, on point. Uh, yeah, the resources and you can see the accrual versus cash accounting. And then you said Joe wrote one on selling an Amazon business that would be helpful yep. for people for sure from, from Prosper Show. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mark, thank you for taking time away from the six kids, your business, everything else. Um, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. Well, thanks for having me on. Thanks for yeah. uh, giving me a break from my six kids. This has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mark. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.